Sorry about that. All right. So at any rate, let's look at, so out in the body, when anywhere in the body, except in the thoracic cavity, where you see a blue vessel, it's a vein. And where you see a red vessel, it's going to be an artery. So look up here in the, where the heart's at in the thoracic cavity. This blue right here and over here are pulmonary arteries. Those are not veins because it's part of the, see how the, it's in the lungs. This is a lung, a right lung. Am I lung pointing at it again? Say that again. Am I pointing at the uh, artery again? I didn't get the place you are trying to describe. The, can you see my pointer? Number six. Yes. You see number six? Yes. Number six is pointing to the right pulmonary artery. That's not a vein. It's this blue, the blue in the thoracic cavity, except for what's coming right here, which I'll talk about in a second. I'm talking about in the lungs, right? Yes. The blue are the arteries and the red are the veins. It's exactly opposite, say, in the leg. Here's a femoral artery down here in the thigh. But, I mean, and right here, the red one is a femoral artery. The blue one is a femoral vein. So out in the body, in the legs, the arms, the head, neck, whatever, the blue structures are the veins, the red structures are the arteries. So the red one, which number on this picture, number 28 is pointing to this little red vessel right here. That's not an artery. Just because it's red, it does not make it an artery. It's That's amazing. the left pulmonary vein. Because the veins bring the heart, the <laughs> blood to the heart, right? All the veins. Well, yeah, all veins carry blood back to the heart. But what I'm, what I'm trying to, Marcia, what, and everybody else, what I'm trying to point out here is just because something's red, you can't call it an artery. Hold on one second. Dog needs to go in or out. Sorry about that. That's all right. That was my doggy. Um, so in the thoracic cavity, the pulmonary circuit, which includes number 27. Look at number 27. That's the pulmonary trunk. Now, here's the heart. Everybody knows that's the heart, right? Here's that little line that I mentioned before. That's the anterior interventricular sulcus. That means what, what's on the left of it right here is the right ventricle. Um, my leg, please. So, Quan, can you mute I'm that sorry. That's okay. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, so this is the right ventricle. So blood's going to go from here into the pulmonary trunk. Well, the pulmonary trunk is an artery. Why is it colored blue? Because the blood's coming from the right side of the heart, which only pumps deoxygenated blood. So the blood's going to go through the pulmonary trunk into the pulmonary arteries to go to the lungs. Now you're gonna breathe in and out, you're gonna oxygenate the blood. Now the blood's gonna lead the lung via the veins, which now are red, which number 28 is pointing to. That's a left pulmonary vein that's gonna go back to the left atrium, which is being blocked by the number 27 arrowhead right here, it's right behind there. So the ones over here are the right pulmonary veins, the red ones, the ones over here are the left pulmonary veins. The blue ones over here are the right pulmonary arteries. The blue ones over here are the left pulmonary arteries, right? So while we're on this picture, let me just show you something. <clears throat> Wherever we see a branching pattern, where, where we see a branch off of a vessel, that means from that point on, the vessel is called something different. When a vessel enters a new part of the body, even if there's no branch, or if there is a branch, the vessel changes its name. So for instance, number 31 is pointing to the superior vena cava right there. All right now, look, it, it, it's, there's a Y right here. See how you see the shape of a Y? So, but this little stretch right there, there's a branch already that goes up the neck. There's also a branch that goes into the shoulder. 
So this little part of the vessel right here of the Y has a name, which number 32 is pointing to it on this side. So this, this part right here, just that little bitty stretch and just that little section at the Y, both of those are the same blood vessel, but on different sides of the body. Number 32 is pointing to the left brachiocephalic vein. If there was a pointer right here, this would be the right brachiocephalic vein. So see, blood's coming through all these veins from the arm, from the shoulder, from the head, coming down and entering that brachiocephalic vein. Same thing from the right side of the body. I mean, the left side of the body over here. So blood's going to come down the brachiocephalic veins to go into the superior vena cava. So see, the superior vena cava is collecting blood from this Y right here from the right side of the body, from the right brachiocephalic vein, and from the left side of the body, from the left brachiocephalic vein. So how do I know the brachiocephalic vein ends right here? How do I know only that part of it is called the brachiocephalic vein? Well, it's easy. Because of the division? Because of the division. There's a split. As soon as it splits, those vessels are called something different, right? for the most part, for the ones that we're learning. So as soon as it splits, look what happens. The big one that's going up the neck, that's called the intern, this is the right internal jugular vein. The, because there's a little bitty one that goes up and it goes external. This one goes up into the skull. This one goes, or it comes from the skull actually. And this one's going to the outside. So the big one <coughs> is called, excuse me, it's called the internal jugular, and the other one is called the external jugular. <clears throat> I need something, some water. Hold on. So, and you have to put right or left. Now, you would have the same thing on this side, but since in the model, the person that made the model has the head turned that way, you see that the neck is, it, it, you can't see all of it. But the blue thing right there that don't have a pointer on it, that would be the left internal jugular vein. Just like number two is pointing to this, to the, the big one right here. That's a, the right internal jugular vein. Somebody tell me what number three is pointing to that I already studied. It is uh, the internal jugular artery. Nope. It's the same place. I know it. <laughs> I think it's the carotid artery. Wait, say that again. Carotid artery, she said. I still couldn't make it out. Carotid artery. Oh, there you go. Uh, sorry, my, I, I'm getting this unstable connection. It kind of cuts in and out. Um, yeah, number three is pointing to the right carotid artery. So the red oh. vessel that goes in your neck is your carotid artery. The one on this side is a right. So that would be the right carotid artery. That would be the left carotid artery over there going up the left side of the head. All right, so let's go into the arm a little bit. The, these vessels go under your clavicle, by the way. The, the clavicle in this model has been removed. So the vessels that go under the clavicle is called subclavian. Sub means below, clavian means clavicle. So the red and the blue vessel that's in your shoulder are always subclavian vessels. The blue one is a subclavian vein. The red one is a subclavian artery. So since this is on the right side of the body, that would be the right subclavian artery, the red one, and the blue one is the right subclavian vein. You have the same thing on the left side of the body over here. The red one is the artery and the blue one is the vein, except you would just put left in front of it right? Um, then as we get at, as, and notice there are some minor branches right here that we, we you're not going to be identifying on this model, but as this main part of the vessel enters the arm, it's going to be called something different. So as soon as you leave this shoulder area and it gets right in here, that's your armpit area. But from here all the way to here, it looks like the same vessel, right? Mm -hmm. 
So the way that you're going to get this correct is by knowing it, what part of the arm it's in. So I know you can't tell, but up here would be your armpit area right here. So if the pointer is more towards the top of this red vessel in the arm, you have to put axillary. Mm -hmm. The word axillary means armpit, if you remember that. Like number mm -hmm. 29, look over here. See how this pointer is pointing to the upper part? Because that all looks like the same vessel. But since it's pointing to the very upper part, it's near the armpit, that, that would be called the left axillary artery. Now, in the middle of the arm or the brachium, if the pointer is pointing there or somewhere right here, you're going to call it the brachial artery. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. All right. So if it's on the right, put right. If it's on the left, put left. Now, the only ones that kind of have weird names, like a lot of these vessels take on the name of the part of body they're in. This number nine is called the basilic vein. And number eight, is called the cephalic vein. So those are kind of strange names where Why they're they at. That? I'm not, you know, Marcia, somebody asked me that I was supposed to look it up and I forgot. I, I don't remember, to be honest with you. I'll try um, to Google. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a question for Google, even for me, right? So, um, but I can find that out if you're interested in knowing. But anyway, here's how you can remember I which am. one is, here's how you can remember which one is which. The basilic vein is really near the bicep. So here, your bicep would be right here. On the outside of the posterior of the arm is a tricep. So look on this side. Here's the outside of the arm over here. Would be towards the outside of the arm, that's cephalic. That would be left cephalic. Over here towards the inside of the arm would be the left basilic. Same thing over here for the right arm. There's a right basilic, that's a right cephalic. All right, so that I just wanted to show you all branching patterns in, in the area of the body, all right? So I'm gonna go to a diff, the next picture. I wanna show you the branching pattern for the iliacs down here. So that, I think there's some questions on that. I want you guys to, to know what it is. So this is the same model. I had just taken a larger picture of it. So what you're looking at down here is the eight, which is called the abdominal aorta. It's in the abdomen. This is the diaphragm up here. So below the diaphragm is all abdomen. Above that is the thoracic cavity. So this is the abdominal aorta. Now there's branches that come off the abdominal aorta. The first branch that comes off the abdominal aorta past the diaphragm. So this is still diaphragm, partially encasing this. That's the esophagus would attach to the stomach right there. So right past the diaphragm. The first branch, which number two is pointing to, is called the celiac trunk, this little thing. And it, so if some people put a celiac artery, I would count it right. Um, but technically, it's a trunk. There's three branches that come off of it. So they actually show two of the three branches on this picture. The splenic artery comes off of it right there and goes over to the spleen. Remember, in the body, the red ones are carrying blood to where they're going. Veins are draining blood away from where they're coming from. So that's a splenic artery going over to the spleen. This is a hepatic artery right here, right? This, the other one. And so the, the third branch that comes off of here, we can't see because the stomach's not here, is a, what's called the left gastric artery. But nonetheless, that's a celiac trunk. That's a splenic artery going to the spleen. This is the hepatic artery. It goes to the liver. There's a liver, part of the liver. The next branch down, don't worry about this purple thing yet. The next artery branch down off of the aorta is this one. This is called the superior mesenteric artery. That's what that is. <clears throat> and then the next branch, at least on this model, past there that's coming down, there would be another branch right here, but um, the arrow is point is, and you can't tell, but there, there's a little branch right there, but number 13 is right on top of it. And when I made the picture, I didn't realize that, so you can't really see it. But this branch is not the inferior mesenteric. Everybody wants to put that. This is the right gonadal artery. So we have arteries that go from the abdominal aorta that go to the gonads, 
And that's the right one. And this one would be the left one over here. But you can't really see it too well. So I doubt they're going to put a pointer on it. But nonetheless, um, look at the branch of the aorta. As, as it, you see another Y branch down here, right? So here's where students confuse uh, the iliacs. Here's how easy it is. When you get to the bottom of the aorta and you see that little upside down Y, as soon as it splits, it's called an iliac. All of these are iliac, something iliac. It's because it's in the hip region. You remember the, the iliac bone of the, uh, of the hip bone in AMP1? Yeah. That's the edge of it right there. That's the top of your, that's the iliac crest right there. All right. So from this region down, you're, you're talking about your hip region. So the very first part before we see a split, notice there's another Y right here. So from this little area before the branch up to this branch, that little section of that artery is called the common iliac. It's called a common iliac. Since it's on the left side of the body, this would be the left common iliac artery. The one on this side, just before that next Y, from here to there, is called the right common iliac artery. Now, what about the next branch pattern that we see? So here's the common iliac. Then all of a sudden we see a branch, an another Y, right? This little part right here that goes in to the structures of the hip, this is called the internal iliac artery. And since it's on the left, that's the left internal iliac artery. This little branch right here would be the right internal iliac artery. So that only leaves the next part of the Y, the biggest, the biggest part of the vessel that keeps going down into the leg. So what is that part called? Well, that's called the external iliac artery. So here's how easy it is. From the end of the aorta, you get to the first split that's called a common iliac. To the next split, the one that goes in is called internal. The one that goes ultimately down into the leg is called the external iliac artery. And then the only thing you have to put is right and left. So left and right common iliacs left and right internal iliac arteries, left and right external iliac artery. So how do I know when this artery changes its name? Well, we have to, I don't have an up close picture of it, I don't think, but we have to go back to this picture. Because it's it splits. So, what's that? Is because it splits. Very see? good, because it's going to a new place in the body. And there is a split, Marcia. You are correct. So as soon as this leaves, here's your hip. Here's the end of your hip. See, if you're that's a, the femur, at the head of the femur right there. This is the end of the hip. So from this point down, there's your femur in the thigh, right? So all these vessels that leave the hip region then are going to be called something femoral except for number 20. So let me show you the next splits. Now, I'm not worrying about deep and superficial and stuff like that, but here, this number 13 is pointing to the right external iliac artery. How do I know that? Because it's right at the end of the hip region. But then if you see right here, Marcia, where you just said it splits, this is going to be and a deep and superficial femoral arteries right here. The only one I put it on right here is just, I just said femoral artery. So if they're pointing to the artery that's near the femur in the thigh, you could just put the femoral artery is fine. All right. Um, and obviously put right or left. So that would be the right one on this side. This would be the left one on this side, right? Right here. The big one, it goes all the way down the leg. So, what about the, the blue vessels? Well, the blue vessels in the hip are also called iliacs. So this is the inferior vena cava, this big blue one. These blue things leaving the kidneys are the renal veins. And then the blue one that, and they might not even have a pointer on that, that's a hepatic vein, all right? 
Now, the purple that you see is a special venule system of the liver. The liver is special because it has a dual blood supply to it. So there is a venule drainage of blood from the intestine that goes up through what's called a portal system. So this purple thing that's going into the liver is called the hepatic portal vein. The blue one specifically is hepatic vein. On this model, the purple is the portal system. So we're gonna learn a little bit more about that when we do the digestive models. But nonetheless, this blue thing is the inferior vena cava. So if you come down to the bottom, I know you can't see behind here, but it splits into another Y. So that split signifies the iliacs. So you would have a common iliac vein and then until it comes to a little split. So you can barely see the split right there for that one. That's the internal iliac vein, just like that little red one's the internal iliac artery. Then past that branch point, which is behind the artery, that's called the external iliac vein. So you have commons, internals, and external iliacs, all right? I uh, just wanted to mention that because some people confuse which one's common, which one's internal, which one's external. So just start at the top and map it out. All right, here's the first split, so that's got to be common. Here's the second split, that's got to be internal, that big one's external. You know, just try and work it out that way. Now, in the leg, <clears throat> a lot of people put this as the femoral vein. That That's wrong. This is not a femoral vein. It's in the thigh, but it goes down the whole leg. This is called a saphenous. This is called the great saphenous vein. Right here, number 20. Now, this is the right one. You would have one on this side, but they cut the, the iliac off, so it doesn't even have the, the femoral vein split into the saphenous over here. They don't have it. But So the one right here that goes all the way down that we can see in the thigh, that's called the great saphenous vein. The one that's next to the femoral artery is the femoral vein. All right, so just remember that. All right, um, that's about it for that. Yeah, so they're not going to have. I'm the only one in in the of the faculty that use these. I like to. I taught all these blood vessels off of these models before we got to the digestive system. Uh, just so we would have it under our belt. I don't think they're putting these in the pre and post labs because I was the only one that actually did this. Um, and I did that because, well, I'll put them in my Spotted book. that one. <laughs> All right. Um, so I don't think these were in the pre and post lab assignments, were they? No. All right, that's fine. And Marcia, if you already learned them, that's great because they're going to be on the next practical anyway. Because these are, these are, uh, organs of, of digestion, except for those are the kidneys right there. This okay. is your pancreas. If you know anybody with pancreatic cancer, that's really bad. This is the organ that's affected. That's a spleen. That's not digestion. That's part of the lymphatic system. But this is the, your first part of the small intestine, and that's the pancreas. So we're going to cover this model in the digestive system, as well as this model. This is the same thing. It's just another model of it. It doesn't have the kidneys on it and stuff. But this is the pancreas, and that's a, the duodenum of the small intestine, and that's the spleen again over there. So it's just another splenic model. That's all it is. So if you already learned it, Marcia, then that's great because we're, we're going to do it on the digestive system anyway. All right. All right. So let me stop sharing that. Let me share the screen. All right. Let's find a heart model. So I could do it from there. All right. So here's the heart uh, that has a frontal section. Now, we looked at a sheep heart earlier that was a frontal section, but it looked all mangled up. Obviously, if you don't get it nice and straight down the middle, it's not going to look that good So, as a model. So here's the right atrium over here. There's a left atrium. This is the, the tricuspid valve. This is the bicuspid valve. So on this model, the front half has been removed. So what's on, we're still looking at the anterior view, 
just in a, a sectional view of it. So what's on my left is actually right, and what's on my right is actually left. I also know that because the thickness of the ventricular myocardium is thicker on this side than it is on this side. So the thicker side is always the left side of the heart, all right? Now, so blood is going to come in from the right atrium through the tricuspid valve down to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, blood is going to go up through the pulmonary semilunar valve. There it is. As the semilunar pulmonary valve opens, blood goes into the pulmonary trunk. Here's the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk courses posteriorly and divides into pulmonary arteries, a left one right here that would go to a left lung, and then a right, the right one we can't Mr. see. Mr. Russo? Yes. I understand all this process. What I was asking is the, uh, how the effect on the arteries and vein when the blood is flowing, if it, it does this question I say I saw you say if the blood flow increase if there's an increase in the artery that will be increasing so, so, so I'm, I'm kind of confused about those words if you can um all right mercy say that one more time I, I I'm not sure of the question that you're referring to what are you saying that just at, let me know what you're saying okay, so is increasing or decreasing increasing arterial um, blood pressure will increase so, so, so those words they kind of confusing you know how the blood flow through the artery if when you increase the um, the blood pressure through the artery it will increase it's kind well, of confusing if you in, if you increase blood pressure which is going to there's going to be some questions on the physiology test concerning the parameters that affect blood pressure for sure if you increase blood pressure you are going, you're going to increase the volume of blood that can get to a tissue, for instance. But some other things have to happen. It's not just a, a yes or no answer, Mercy, is what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. you. We increase blood pressure in the body ultimately to force blood to go in some direction. So technically, if we want to increase the volume of blood flow that goes to a tissue, you're gonna to have to do really two things. You're gonna to have to vasoconstrict blood vessels somewhere in the body, but vasodilate the blood vessels in the tissue that you want to increase blood flow to. Now, that gets a little bit into the weeds for the discussion that we're having now, about how all of that happens. But where we vasoconstrict, we increase pressure. And where we vasodilate, you actually decrease the pressure a little bit. Now, the reason why that's important is because blood can only ever flow down a pressure gradient. So if you want more blood to go to the vessel that you vasodilated, you have to vasoconstrict downstream from it somewhere. So you're actually increasing a blood pressure gradient. Now, if I'm understanding right, the type of question you're referring to is not getting that involved. So the an to, to answer your question, to increase blood pressure, you have to do two things. You have to increase the amount of blood that is pumped out of the ventricles every minute, which is cardiac output. You have to increase cardiac output. You also have to, you can also increase systemic vascular resistance. So how do you increase cardiac output? And how do you increase systemic vascular resistance? Well, that's the parameters that were on, which I don't have it pulled up, was on the PowerPoint that I taught from uh, in the video that you saw. Did y'all watch the video from the other class about blood pressure and stuff? I did. Okay, yeah. good. Um, in that PowerPoint, there is a flow chart that has all the parameters that affect cardiac output to the left. There's a, and on the right side of the flow chart are all the parameters that affect resistance. So how do we increase cardiac output to increase blood pressure? 
Well, there's two main parameters, stroke volume and heart rate. Stroke volume is the volume of blood that each ventricle pumps into their artery every beat of the heart. It's called a stroke volume because on each stroke of the heart, what is the volume of blood that is ejected up into its artery? It's called the stroke volume. The stroke volume then depends on two things. The stroke volume depends on how much blood is entering the ventricle from the atrium. So if we can increase the volume of blood that gets into a ventricle, the ventricle is gonna swell up a little bit like an overfilled water balloon. I mean, it makes sense, right? If we put more blood in, it's gonna stretch the wall of the ventricle, right? Yes. Just like if you put more water in a water balloon, it's gonna stretch the balloon. Well, the stretch on the wall of the myocardium has a name. It's called the preload. So the preload is just a fancy word for stretching the wall of the ventricle. Now, the reason why we want to try and stretch the wall of a ventricle is because the more it is stretched, when the ventricle goes to contract to pump the blood into its artery, the, the more that it's stretched, the harder it contracts is the point. So it's the same thing as if I tell, told you to take a rubber band and stretch it and let go of it. It's going to snap back. Everybody knows that. But now take the rubber band and just stretch it as far as you can and let go of it. It's going to snap back harder. So if we can force more blood to get into this ventricle than normal, the wall is going to be stretched more and the ventricle is going to contract harder during systole. Ventricular systole is contraction. So during ventricular systole, if it's stretched already, we have more blood in here, it's going to eat contract harder and eject more blood into its artery. So the stroke volume is going to go up on that beat. So what makes an increased preload or an increased stretch? Well, the volume of blood that's in here, right? And so the volume of blood that gets into a ventricle, the volume that we have in there just prior to ventricular contraction is called the end diastolic volume, the EDV. The EDV is just a fancy word for the volume of blood that is in a ventricle just before it contracts. Because let's face it, as soon as the ventricle goes to contract, you can't put any more blood in there, right? Because if the ventricle is trying to contract down on itself, this valve is going to close. Correct? Right. Yeah. All right. So it's the only time that you can fill a ventricle with blood is during relaxation or diastole. As soon as the ventricle contracts, you can't put any more blood in there. So the total blood volume that is already in a ventricle just before it contracts is called the EDV. So if we can increase the EDV, you're going to increase the stretch on the wall of the ventricle. And so that would increase the contraction force, which increases the volume of blood that is ejected into its artery, which is stroke volume. Um, let me see if I could pull this thing up. Hold on. Looks like some people are really confused. Marcia, are you confused on this? Um, a little bit, but I, <laughs> Hold on there's a, a there's a jet that just came out above my head and it was so loud that I, I almost oh. had a heart attack. All right. Let me, let me pull up something that I made for lecture. This will help make sense. So the map that you were the the map you were talking about, like how the factor the factors that affect blood pressure, on the side, you have like increased number of red blood cells as polycythemia. Those are like the negative effects of why blood pressure would be increased and increased body size and obesity. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm gonna talk about that in one second. But yeah. So 
but those are specifically dealing with resistance. What I'm talking, okay. so the two ways that blood pressure increases, I'm talking about the normal way that we want it to increase right now. Okay. There are two reasons why blood pressure increases in our body. You increase cardiac output, that's the volume of blood pumped out every minute, that the, heart, that the ventricles pump into the arteries every minute. If you increase how much blood the heart's pumping into the artery, you're going to increase blood pressure. Because if you decrease, if this arrow was down, if you decrease cardiac output, you're going to decrease blood pressure. So, um, and so let me just go through, through this real quick. All right. So what, what affects cardiac output? Well, stroke volume and heart rate. If your heart beats faster every, in one minute than it normally does, obviously you're going to be pumping more blood out. That's the easy one. Heart rate goes up. The volume of blood the heart's pumping out goes up, at least to a theoretical maximum. If your heart rate goes above the theoretical maximum, then you're actually the cardiac output can drop. I don't even want to get into that bag of worms yet, but nonetheless, if, if the heart rate goes up, your, your CO goes up and blood pressure would go up. Stroke volume also affects it. So that's the volume of blood that the ventricles pump out on each beat. So what controls stroke volume? Well, how hard the ventricle contracts controls it. If they contract harder, they pump more blood out on that one beat. The preload, if the wall of the ventricle is stretched, it contracts harder. So you would pump out more blood on that beat. So even if heart rate stayed the same, let's say heart rate stays the same. If the stroke volume went up, your cardiac output is going to still go up. Because, and y'all have to know this formula for the physiology test, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. So, <coughs> excuse me. So if, let's say, let's say this number was two and this number is two. Just put the numbers in there. When you multiply that together, that means cardiac output is going to be four. Let's say the heart rate stays two but stroke volume becomes eight. What's the cardiac output then? 16. 16. So even if one of them stays the same, if the other one went up, cardiac output would still go up. It's a simple equation. Cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. If either one of these goes up, cardiac output is going to go up. All right. So, this cardiac output concept map is something I made for lecture, but it has the parameters on it, right? So let's look at the top. If we're, if we're running or working out, we want our, our cardiac output to go up so we can send more blood to the tissue, our muscle in the body. So how does that happen? Well, hey, Mr. Here, Russell, go ahead. Excuse me. Can I log off now? I have a doctor's appointment. Yeah, you can log off. That's fine. I okay, didn't intend on getting into all the, the physiology stuff, but I'm, if, if you need to go, you can. Okay, is it is still being recorded, right? I'm pretty sure I had to have it recorded. I see. Yet. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay. All right. So, look at the top up here. These are some factors that affect preload. So, if I need, if I want to increase preload to increase stroke volume, how do I do that? Well, preload is the stretch on the ventricular myocardium. What causes preload? Oh, the volume of blood that gets to a ventricle before it contracts. That's the EDV. So how can I increase the EDV? Well, I can increase the volume of blood that is returning to the heart faster. If I can return the blood to the heart faster than normal, the EDV is going to go up. So that is an inherent process that's called venous return. When you start contracting muscles, your muscles squeeze on veins and it squishes the blood back to the heart faster, so you increase the EDV. But what else can cause, which would be vaso, uh, for the veins, vasoconstriction is called venoconstriction. That's what this word is. So under extreme workout, moderate to extreme workout, or fight or flight responses, we can get a little bit of vasoconstriction of a vein. It's called venoconstriction. So if we constrict our veins, or we have physical activity, or we increase Blood volume in the body. 
you're going to increase how much blood returns to the heart. I mean, let's face it. If you drink more fluid and you increase your blood volume, there's more volume in there to push back to the heart. Or if you're a nurse, you hang an IV bag on somebody, you're going to increase their blood volume because you're pushing fluid into their vessel, into their vein. So if there's more blood in the body, there's more blood to return to the heart, which means the EDV would go up. This is also the same concept of why you hang an IV bag on a person that is severely dehydrated. The number one problem with a severe dehydrated patient is their blood pressure is too low. You hang an IV bag on them, you increase blood volume, that's going to increase, which increases the volume of blood that gets to a ventricle, which is called the EDV, which increases the stretch on the wall of the ventricle, which is the preload, which increases contractility to increase stroke volume, which increases cardiac output, which increases blood pressure. And you just saved your patient. Why did you save your patient? You increased their blood volume to increase venous return, to increase the EDV, to increase the preload, to increase stroke volume, to increase cardiac output. Does that make somewhat, somewhat what, more sense now? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> All right. So let me get back to your other question, whoever said it. And I don't have it pulled up, but let me um, go back to our class and pull up our engage manual. I want to show you what they were talking about in here real quick. Here it is. No, that's not the one. All right, now, if you scroll down <clears throat> or turn your page if you have a paper book, and you get to blood vessel physiology, it has total peripheral resistance. So in my PowerPoint, it says systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. That's because that's resistance specifically in a systemic circuit. Total peripheral resistance includes the resistance in all the vessels in the body. So the, the other factor that causes blood pressure to go up, which somebody was saying that there, in certain cases, we don't want the pressure to go up. If you're, run, if you're working out, you want your, your pressure to increase to increase blood flow to the tissue in the body. Hold on one second. Sorry about that, but there are conditions where we don't want it to happen and our blood pressure is high. That means you would have hypertension. So the scenario that I was just going over were some normal parameters that would happen if you went and jumped on a treadmill mm -hmm. and started working out, right? So let's look at the other end of blood pressure. The other end of blood pressure is resistance. So blood pressure depends on two things, cardiac output, which we just covered, and resistance. Now, there are several... Anything that makes resistance increase, by the way, increases blood pressure. So there are some times that we want it to increase. So I'm going to go over that scenario with you. And then we'll talk about the uh, pathophys type stuff where we don't want it to happen. So look at the parameters that affect resistance. Vessel length, vessel diameter, uh, this elasticity, viscosity of uh, the blood, and basically blood volume, which is going to affect really cardiac output, but uh, also increases resistance if there's more blood in the system. So let's go over these first. Vessel length is not physiologically regulated. It's pretty much set. Unless you gain a whole lot of weight, like in obesity or whatnot, you gain vessel length to supply the extra tissue, adipose tissue and whatnot. So if a vessel is longer, the longer the vessels get, the more resistance the blood meets. And if there's more resistance, the heart has to work harder in order to move the blood through that higher resistant vessel. So that's not good. So our, once you already grow, you're grown up, you stop growing, your vessels aren't getting longer except in people that gain a whole lot of weight. 
That's the bad part. This is only one aspect of it. So everybody knows that uh, people that gain a whole lot of weight are at risk of high blood pressure. They're at risk of diabetes mellitus, right? They're at risk of certain types of cancers on and on. Everybody knows this already, right? That's why we need to try and work out, eat right, and lose weight. Everybody knows that. Right. Well, this is just one aspect of, hey, why is it bad to be way overweight? Because we have, we, we're increasing all of these vessels in that extra tissue. It makes the heart work harder. And over a long period of time, it damages the heart. So obviously, we don't want this one to happen, right? Now, in fact, the only one out of all of these that we really want to physiologically control and the one that we truly only do physiologically control is number two, vessel diameter. So this deals with vasoconstriction and vasodilation. If you vasodilate a blood vessel, you're going to decrease the resistance in the blood vessel, which decreases the pressure in that particular vessel. Now, if you're working out, you have your sympathetic nervous system firing and you have your adrenaline hormones being released from the adrenal gland. It's a sympathetic response when you work out. So during a sympathetic response, like a fight or flight you learned about in AMP1, some vessels in the body dilate, but other ones constrict. So which ones dilate? Well, as it turns out, blood vessels in your muscles dilate during a sympathetic event. Blood vessels in your heart, your lungs, your brain, your liver, those essential organs all get vasodilated. But blood vessels in your digestive system, your reproductive system, your urinary system, your skin, all of those get vasoconstricted. That's all, it's nothing more than a fight or flight response you learned in chapter 15 of AMP1. It's a redistribution of blood around the body. Because let me just tell you this, if I didn't tell you all that already, if you're working out and you need to send more blood to your muscles that are working out, guess what you have to do? You have to take blood from another tissue somewhere in the body because you only have a set volume of blood. So if you have to send more blood somewhere, you got to take blood from somewhere else. So how do you do that? Well, you vasoconstrict the non-essential tissues but you vasodilate the, where you want the blood to go. So what you're really doing by vasodilating and vasoconstricting is you are creating a pressure gradient. So at one part of the body, you're gonna increase pressure. And at, in the tissue where you want more blood flow, you're gonna slightly decrease the pressure because you decrease the resistance. But you still need to have a high pressure gradient. That's why, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complex than what you are reading in your textbook because you're, we're, we're learning out of a sophomore level textbook. Mm -hmm. So there are some other factors that go into play. Yes, when you vasodilate, you decrease pressure. When you vasoconstrict, you increase pressure. And then you read in your book, well, if we want to increase pressure to increase blood flow to a tissue, well, that's true as well. In a roundabout way, we have to increase pressure somewhere to increase the pressure gradient. Because if you're sending more blood from your stomach to your muscles, you have to vasoconstrict at your stomach, which increases the pressure there, which forces the blood to go downstream. You vasodilate the vessels in the tissue you want more blood to go to, and by vasodilating, what you're really doing is allowing more volume to get through that vessel. Does that make sense? So yes, ba vasoconstriction increases resistance and increases pressure. Vasodilation decreases resistance and decreases pressure. That's what you need to know for this test. Now, vasomotor tone, that deals with constriction and dilation. This is just smooth muscle contraction. Um, vessel elasticity. So our large vessels in our body are elastic. And so they have the ability to accommodate a large volume of blood flow through them at one time, and they get this bounding out effect. And so when we're younger, our vessels are more elastic. And so when the volume of blood decreases all of a sudden in there, the vessel bounds back on itself. Well, <clears throat> as we get older, 
our vessel elasticity goes down. And if vessel elasticity goes down, then your resistance goes up because the vessel can't give with the blood that's flowing through it, right? It's, it's an un it, it starts to become more, um, I don't wanna say solid. It becomes less rubbery. I don't, I don't know how I can set, explain it to you. If, if you have a, a big volume of blood that's being ejected out into the aorta from the left ventricle, that large volume of blood that's being pumped out on that stroke volume, that, that beat is going to bound outward. It, it stretches the, the aorta. You just put a large volume of blood into it all of a sudden. So it stretches a little bit. Well, all of a sudden, in, in younger individuals, the aorta snaps back on itself, just sort of like the preload of the ventricle, but it's doing it in an artery. So the artery snaps back on itself and it helps propel the blood forward. So when we get older, that elasticity goes down, which means we have a higher resistance force. And that leads to a higher blood pressure in older individuals. Now that can happen because of many different reasons, calcium deposits, whatever the case may be. Um, damage, uh, fatty plaque buildup, uh, heart, arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis are the terms that y'all probably know, all right? Um, now viscosity, we don't, we don't change either <laughs> physiologically, but it can change in certain pathological states or, or at certain times uh, in a person's life, depending on what their body is going through. And so what is viscosity? Well, viscosity is a relationship between the number of blood cells relative to the volume of water in the blood, which is plasma. So how much plasma do you have relative to the cells in the blood? Well, if the, if the water volume goes down, like in de severe dehydration, the number of cells stay the same. So if someone is dehydrated, that means they lost their water, their blood gets thicker. They don't have as much water in it. So in that case, the viscosity is going to go up. Well, right here it says hematocrit. Now we have, we're going to learn this this week. The hematocrit is the number of red blood cells per unit volume of blood. So if you have too many red blood cells per unit volume of blood than normal, that's a, what we would call a high hematocrit. That means your blood gets thicker because you have too many cells in it. We don't want that to happen either. So we basically want the number of cells to stay about the same so the blood doesn't get too thick, but it doesn't get too thin either, right? So we, want, we typically want our viscosity to stay the same. Um, now, as far as volume is concerned, that's what I was explaining with cardiac output. If you have, if you increase blood volume, more volume is going to hit the wall of a vessel when the blood moves through it. And resistance occurs because blood is moving through the vessel. Blood pressure is the force that blood exerts on the inside wall of a vessel as the blood is moving through the vessel. That's called blood pressure, by the way. It's the force that blood exerts on the wall. Resistance, on the other hand, is the opposite force. It's the force that the wall of the vessel is applying back to the moving blood that's trying to move through it. So if we can increase the resistance, you're going to increase blood pressure. You know why? because they're exactly opposite forces. Now that's only if the heart can keep up with it. So in pathological states, if the resistance gets way too high and the heart cannot generate enough force to move the blood through the high resistant vessel, then a person's gonna go into heart failure and they're gonna die. That's why arteriosclerosis, is bad as we get over time and high blood pressure is bad as we get older. Those are the silent killers because over time, your heart is being damaged from having to contract so hard for so long over your life 
to move blood through a high resistant vessel. So people that have hardened arteries, which is at, uh, at arteriosclerosis, that leads to high pressure because arteriosclerosis increases resistance. Why? Because arteriosclerosis means your vessel elasticity is lower than normal. And a vessel that has a lower elasticity has a higher resistance. So does that all make sense now? Whomever asked a question? Yes, it does. All right, very good. Thank um, you. All right, so since we're on this page, <clears throat> um, there's a table at the end of that PowerPoint I was teaching from, if y'all watched a video already uh, from last week, it has these hormones in it, atrial natriuretic peptide, antidiuretic hormone, um, angiotensin II, nitric oxide. You need to go review those hormones and the effect on cardiac output, output and blood pressure. It's in a table in that PowerPoint, all right? All right. 